So, uh, in the last class we were uh, discussing multivariable control and we said uh, uh, several inputs to, se uh, to manipulate several outputs to control uh, that problem is one where there is significant interaction and we saw an example of that interaction we said that depending on what kind of error the controller sees you can essentially um, divide the control schemes into two classes one is centralized control and one is decentralized control in decentralized control only a partial um, list of errors or subset of errors are is actually seen whereas in the uh, So in this in this case, it's a it's a case of a decentralized control where each of the individual controllers, the temperature controller, the level controller, both see individual errors. They don't see the combined errors. For example, the temperature controller looks at only the error in temperature, but not in the level, and the level controller looks at errors only in the level and not in the temperature, and they act independently. Although when they act a change in cold water stream uh, affects both temperature and level, a change in hot water stream also affects uh, temperature and level. So, it might you might come, come up with a situation where uh, the uh, loops may not necessarily coexist. For example, a change in a, a disturbance stream, let us say the temperature, uh, there is a temperature change then that will cause the cold stream to change, the cold stream uh, change will impact to mitigate the temperature disturbance, but it will increase the level and so the level will kick in and start manipulating the hot water flow rate so that the level comes back on target because of which the temperature gets affected and so these two loops can actually keep on acting or sometimes even fight against each other which might lead to an eventual uh, uh, destabilization of the loops. So, we have to make a decision on whether to go centralized or decentralized. Uh, centralized essentially means that the controller sees all the errors or the errors associated with all the variables and in decentralized the controller sees there are several controllers each of them see only their local errors and we would like to come up with schemes that essentially uh, a response to various kinds of disturbances in a stable manner or tracks targets in a stable manner. So, as a quick recap what we also did in the last class was define the poles and zeros of a multivariable transfer function given several inputs to manipulate given several outputs to control your dynamics process dynamics is essentially a matrix of transfer functions relating several of the inputs to several of the outputs. So, you need to relook at what is the definition of a 0, what is the definition of a pole and we saw that in the last class. We also said that the closed loop stability is governed by a characteristic equation, it is equivalent in the multivariable domain will be the return difference matrix I plus GGC inverse that is the uh, return difference matrix and the solution of that. Uh, determinant of i plus g is equal to 0 gives the closed loop poles and that determines stability. So, we quickly saw this and then we got into this problem of determining whether we need to go decentralized or centralized and we have to make that decision. So, on what basis do we make that decision? We say okay, let us first assume that we are going to do multi loop or uh, think one loop at a time and then look at the extent of interaction, the extent of interaction is not strong then you can live with multi loop, if the extent of interaction is um, if the extent of interaction is strong then you might think of going multi variable ok. So, assess the nature of the interaction we said we will do two conceptual experiments, one of them would be for a 2 by 2 input 2 output case we said let us assume the u i y j pairing is correct to generalize u i y j pairing is correct. If we have to do this conceptual experiment you first keep all the loops including the u i y j loop open and carry out a perturbation in u i 
in this case u1 look at its effect on all the outputs term that as the direct effect when you are looking at the yj in this case y1 okay term that as a direct effect the second part of the experiment would be keeping ui yj loop only open and assuming all other loops to be perfect control under perfect control which means in this case keeping u1 y1 open and keeping all other loops meaning the u2 y2 is closed under the assumption of perfect control repeat the step change in u1 if you do that then y1 experiences two effects one is the direct effect and the second effect will be via y2 and being perfect control u2 changes because of which again y1 changes so you see two effects on y1 let's combine those two effects and we said that delta y1 would be the direct effect delta y r would be the retaliatory effect so the ratio of the direct effect to the sum of the total effect is what one would call as the relative gain area which relative because in one case the loops are open and the other case all loops except the assumed pairing are closed so the ratio of that would essentially give you the relative gain um, matrix uh, relative gain uh, element and if you put all of these lambda ijs together then it becomes a relative gain matrix okay and based on the value of the relative gain we saw that we can make decisions on whether it is for example if lambda 11 one one is equal to 1 then retaliatory action is not present if it is be, between 0 and 1 retaliatory action is present comparable to the direct action but in the same direction if it is zero retaliatory action is much greater than the direct effect so you need to look at other pairings if it is greater than 1 it's in the opposite direction to the direct action and smaller in magnitude if it is less than zero retaliatory effect is large and opposite in direction to them so only in this case you will not consider the ij pairing okay in all other cases you would consider it if they are sufficiently close to 1 if it is close to 0.5 then the interactions are very strong and maybe multi loop is not a good choice you may actually have to go for an inherently multi variable controller because the values of lambdas would be 0.5 okay closer to 0.5 so the summary of these two conceptual experiments is what we just discussed but in practice you don't do those conceptual experiments recognizing two things one is that in both in all these cases we are waiting for the steady state to happen so if you are waiting for the steady state to happen then the steady state effect is captured in the gains and so we wrote two expressions in the last class which i'll repeat here that the relative gain matrix can directly be calculated it can directly be calculated because it's a steady state gain so r g a which is what we would call as the relative gain array or actually a relative gain matrix but for some reason it's called as an array matrix this contains elements lambda ij i comma j belonging to number of outputs and inputs assuming it's square okay how is this lambda ij evaluated lambda ij can be evaluated rga at steady state s equal to 0 it can be evaluated as you essentially say lambda ij is equal to r ij times k ij where k ij is the steady state gain matrix so steady state state gain matrix and we said k k i j and r i j is the elements of the matrix r so they belong to the element r which is k inverse k inverse transpose right so this is k minus t so you take inverse of k transpose it the call that matrix as r rij 
if the elements of that are if it multiply element element so this is an element by element multiplication of r j and k i j and that will i j okay so this is, if you are calculating r j at steady state you can also calculate the r j at different level of omega so you can i put that as r j s equal to j omega this gives you what's called as a dynamic r j and you can do this as a function of omega S is equal to J omega. Okay, yeah. I J belongs to the set. Excuse me, the set of inputs and outputs. I'm handwriting that bad. Number of inputs and outputs. Yeah. Yeah. S I J does capture some kind of Lambda i j and lambda j i, whether they are related, okay. We will come to the properties of lambda i j. Lambda i j and lambda j i are related. Okay. Turns out that if I write the R g a in terms of the lambda, so for example, an R g a for a two by two system, R g a for a two by two system will contain lambda one one, lambda one two. Right now, it turns out that summation lambda i j over j is also equal to one, and lambda i j over i is also equal to one. So, if I sum up, we will see this in the tutorial why this has to be true. If you sum up along this or along this, the sum of r j turns out to be one. The the RJ elements turn out to be one. So if you are asking me if I know lambda one two and what its relationship to lambda two one, the relationship is to lambda one one actually. So for example, if you say point eight, this is point two, this will also be point two. This will be point eight because it has to sum up to one. Okay, we will see why this property has to be true. It has to. It is related with this. But when we actually solve it, we will be a little more clear about that. Okay. Okay. So in practice, you don't have to do those two conceptual experiments. If you have an estimate of the steady state gain, you can evaluate R J at steady state. If you have a transfer function matrix, you can set S equal to J omega at a variety of frequencies. Calculate the R J at each of those frequencies. You can do a plot if you wish, and that will give you the dynamic R J elements. Uh, R J satisfies these properties. That summation across row and column, the matrix has to sum up to one. Okay. Questions up to this point? So, if lambda uh, any of the lambda I J S are close to one, you would definitely go for that pairing. If any lambda I J combination is 0.5, you may decide to go decentralized because you are essentially getting a strong interaction from the other loops. Okay. So that would just be some rules of thumb. If lambda Correct. Correct. So, by if this is one close to one, then this will be close to zero because it has to sum up to one. So, this will be close to one. So, you have taken care of y two. So, pairing would be uh, see the see. Block diagram is just notional, right? Um, let's go back to the block diagram. Yeah. See, this diagram is really notional. Because actually, what it means, I can always draw a dotted diagram around this and say those are the two inputs. Now, how how I'm going to pair them? It's like uh, taking an electrical circuit and putting U1 to Y2 and U2 to Y1, right? Yeah. What what the closing the loop means? For example, if I decide on U1 Y2 pairing, then I have a target for Y2. I have a measurement for Y2. I generate an error. When I pair U1 to Y2, U1 is determined by the error in Y2. U2 is determined by an error in Y1. If we go decentralized, if we go centralized, then 
both the errors determine u1 and u2 simultaneously okay ha huh. no that's what i want to uh, indicate to you so let's just take the same block diagram we keep that there let me just redraw it in a slightly different way here so i have let me just first draw the flow g11 g12 g21 g22 and now i have u1 going here i have u1 also coming here adding up i have u2 also going up here and adding up here so let me just move this now and i have y1 i have y2 okay now what is meant by pairing u1 to y2 i'll take this okay take it up here i have a y2 target okay and through a controller gc2 i determine y2 so this is u1 pairing to y2 Does that answer your question? What goes in here is y two desired, because in practice, the process is like a black box to me, with only two manipulated inputs and two measured outputs. So now, how I connect them? I can choose to connect it in this manner and choose to connect that to this, and it will still be decentralized. It's not centralized, though in practice. u1 impacts y1 and y2 the effect of that interaction will be negligible based on lambda ijs okay now this may happen only at steady state it may not happen during dynamic in the di during dynamics it might it's possible that you may have a strong interaction now that's something that has to be assessed via dynamic rg and we'll do that problem in the tutorial okay we'll first say let's assume a pairing okay based on steady state considerations now let's confirm this pairing if we have to look at the dynamic situation where there is changing us and changing ys with time will the loop still remain decentralized if the loops do not remain decentralized i would expect your undivided attention please if u1 and u y1 if u1 y2 u2 y1 are still not decentralized if there is a strong interaction it might show up in the dynamic case okay so that's something you may have to worry about checking your steady state pairing or pairing your based on steady state considerations you want to cross very verify that in the during the dynamic case okay that might entirely happen that the pairing might be incorrect and so this is an area that people call reconfigurable control if i have a fast disturbance that's affecting the process i would want to reconfigure my control loops in different way than under normal situation okay sorry interaction wise we are not saying it negligible all that we are saying is when the two loops are paired in this manner so let me just complete this uh, y1 is measured and through a comparator with a desired value of y d1 uh, i determine the error and i connect it to u2 okay when the loops are closed if there is a step change in y2 because of which u1 changes y2 changes when y2 changes you know uh, y2 is paired so u1 changes u1 changes uh y1 y1 also changes so then u2 will change right so let me just put the signs here plus minus sorry plus and minus here plus and minus here plus and plus here so when y when u1 changes y2 changes okay uh, but also y1 changes and so u2 will change this way and so on so in all of these loop interactions the loops do not fight each other now the effect of interaction is very small if lambda ij is equal to or closer to 1 that's what we realized through this exercise right when we took the ratio 
we said that retaliatory action is not present. Why? Because if you see the expression, the expression is delta y1 divided by delta y1 plus delta yr. If delta yr, if lambda 1 1 is 1, then delta yr has to be 0. So, eventually when you pair the loops, the retaliatory action will be very small. Now, that may be because the interaction transfer function is less or it could be that the actions are taken in such a way that they compensate and so there is no effect on y1. That could also be a result of the uh, uh, pairing. Okay. So, uh, based on steady state criteria, you have decided that 1 1 could be a good pairing if lambda 1 1 is equal to 1. If lambda 1 is equal to 0 0.5, then the loops actually fight. But again, this is on steady state considerations. You have to verify this for the dynamic case. Okay. If I, if whatever pairing you have based on steady state criteria, it might happen that they may not be valid for the dynamics, in which case you may have to go in for the dynamic um, RG. Okay. We do some more problems in the tutorial. So, this is you know a slide that talks about the extent of interactions. Suppose I decide to pair y1 to m1 in this case and with a gc1, then the extent of interactions will be as shown by the dotted line. You will get that going to g21 back and then going up and affecting y1 and this keeps on happening. If the, if the nature of the interaction is such that the lambda i j is less than 1, then the two loops will never coexist. If it turns out that it is close to 1, then the loops can coexist and therefore, that would be a good pairing for the system. Okay. Questions at this point? Okay. So, if you go ahead and do the design, if you have to do the single input single output design for this case, then G C 1 will be based only on G 1 1. Although there is going to be an interaction, when you actually do the design, you will go ahead and design the multi loop controller based on only the subsystem dynamics. In this case, the subsystem dynamics is G11, the other subsystem dynamics is G22. Okay. If I decide to pair U1 to Y2, then what is the subsystem dynamics? If the reverse pairing is what I have chosen, M1 to Y2 and M2 to Y1. See, in this case, what is the plant? For the controller design, what is the plant? You are thinking single input, single output, mind you, because you have two controllers here, but the two loops, you are still thinking multi loop or two single input, single output controllers. What is the plant on which the controller will be designed in this case? G11 for, for GC1, G22 for GC2. If I interchange the pairings, if I say M1 controls Y2 and M2 controls Y1, what is the plant? Right, the plant would then be G21, and the plant for this would be G12. Okay, is that clear? And the controller will be based on G21 and G22. Okay, so if you are going to be this flexible about it, then can you tell me if I do this, uh, this kind of a design that is U1 Y1 pairing, U2 Y2 pairing, what is M1? and G, G21, what is M1 and G21 as far as this loop is concerned? It is a disturbance, it is a measured disturbance, unmeasured disturbance, measured disturbance. Is a disturbance transfer function known or unknown? It is known. So, what is it that you can do? Okay. Now, if you go ahead and do feed forward control to this loop, okay. You can exactly compensate the effect of the disturbances because the disturbance is measured, the transfer function is known, and if you are able to do this, then this is what is called decoupling control. Okay. Okay. So here is what is the decoupling control doing. Okay. Decoupling control now just ignore this for the time being, ignore these two for the time being. Okay. You have the same loops v1, u1 is equal to v1, u2 is equal to v2, let us ignore these two for the time being. 
then this loop is the same as this loop correct it is exactly the same as this loop correct yes or no yes no yes ok now let us look at implementing feed forward controller so what is it now we said that this is a signal which is a disturbance if sorry sorry this one this is a disturbance right if this is a disturbance can i take feed forward control by designing a feed forward controller like so okay likewise as far as this loop is concerned this is a disturbance can i design a feed forward controller that looks like here Because remember in feed forward control what is the feedback action and the feed forward control are added right in feedback feedback plus feed forward your feedback plus feed forward is added here ok. So, you have essentially a controller command coming from the feedback controller you have a feed forward controller these are added to compensate for this disturbance. Likewise for this controller the two effects are added for this disturbance. So, now what is the feed forward controller and if you know the disturbance transfer function and the plant minus disturbance divided by plant. What is the disturbance as far as this loop is concerned? G21. What is the plant? So, minus G22 minus G21 by G22 will be the feed forward controller for this one. G i 2 which is the feed forward controller is minus G 2 1 by G 2 2 correct. As far as this loop is concerned this is the feed forward controller this is the disturbance this is the plant. So, minus G 1 2 by G 1 1 that is the feed forward controller correct yes yes or no everybody is clear about this it is just a simple extension of thinking multi loop and then bringing in the necessary feed forward controllers. So, that now it becomes a case of decoupling control why is it decoupling control because whenever this guy is going to affect here ok this guy is going to compensate that through feed forward action. Whenever this guy is going to affect there this guy is going to take compensatory action on u1 so that the effect is annulled and so these two loops are as if they are decoupled the one controller effect does not affect the other and vice versa yes no clear not clear it turns out then if you do that then you get loops that look like this. The two loops are now completely decoupled, but they come in with a small complexity. The complexity is that the plant now is become more difficult. Earlier the plant was only G 1 1 now the plant is taking care of the interaction. So, the plant becomes more difficult the controller design becomes more difficult. Now, how did we come up with all of this? We start from the same equation here. I am just going back. Y1, the open loop uh, equations are Y1 is G11 U1 plus G12 U2, Y2 is G21 U1 plus G222. That is the open loop relationship between U1 U2 and Y1 Y2. Okay. Now, what we do is we postulate this feed forward controller. We say U1, which is actually the plant input, is V1, which is the feedback controller output plus the effect of a disturbance V2. Okay. Likewise, u2 is v2 plus g i2 v1 and this matches with this block diagram here u1 is v1 plus g i1 v2. Can you see this? u1 is v1 plus v2 times g i1, right. So, that is what we are saying here, ok. Likewise, for u1, so you have these two equations substitute this into those equations and you will get the relationship instead of with respect to u1 you will get the relationship in terms of v1 and now you force the diagonal relationship you say 
that this guy has to go to 0 as far as y1 v1 is concerned and this guy has to go to 0 as far as y1 v2 is concerned right you can you can force it whichever way you want and that will solve for the feed forward controller directly. So for example if I say y1 should be paired with v1 with this impact going to 0 then I will get I can solve for g i1 as g i1 is minus g12 divided by g11. Likewise if I say y2 must be affected only by v2 I put this to be equal to 0 and solve for g i2. g i2 will be minus g21 divided by g22. And those are the two designs that I have written on the next page over there. Right. So now what happens is you have essentially decoupled those controls. Only thing now your plant has become a little more complex, but then somewhere you know uh, the interaction has to be modeled. So it has now come into the plant and now you have to design controllers for this. In the earlier case multi loop control you had the design based only on the plant only on the uh, you know the pairing v1 y1 or v1 y2 in this case now you are also looking at the presence of the interaction okay. Okay, questions up to this point any questions up to this point. So what do you do if you have a non square system there is a under defined system leave out the variables that are least likely to cause stability problems and then pair them. So if I have for example under defined would be more inputs or more outputs under defined systems more outputs. So leave out the variables that are least likely to cause stability and then pair the loops. For over defined systems more inputs look at various combinations of the inputs that have a favorable RG. Now you ha have a choice. So now I can base it uh, on an interaction analysis and say which ones have the most favorable RGA whichever the ones have closest to 1 I will pick them and then pair the loops okay. I think this is a repetition okay um, and then of course to account for the presence of interaction you will have to uh, detune the loops yeah. okay. So we talked about this and then these are these are essentially multivariable controllers can you think why? this is a multivariable controller why is this a, what is the difference between a multivariable controller and a multi loop controller the error the error that the controller sees in this case what is the error that the controller sees actually this may not be as representative as this what is the error that gc1 sees Although only the measurement is going, the it is actually y1 which is the output of a different plant, it is a different plant now, it looks at the presence of the interactions as well. So this the error that is that is that the controller sees, both the controller C are now not independent, I mean the GC1 sees both the errors, GC2 also sees both the errors. Just that from a design perspective the two loops are decoupled but as far as the error analysis is concerned both the controllers see both the errors and thereby you can uh, call this scheme as a multivariable scheme. In a multi loop scheme the controller sees only one error okay the, the error related to its subsystem okay. Now I could extend this further and I can have for example uh, you know even larger for example you know what I could think of is something like so I could think of a transfer fun function matrix Y that has something like this okay. Um, so it is a 5 input um, and then there are sparse elements here with the rest being 0. <coughs> And likewise, there could be some sparse elements here, but uh, the rest could be zero. Something like this. Okay, so this times u1, u2, u3, 
u4 and u5. Okay, y will be, so this is a vector u, this will be y1, y2, y3. Okay, I can have this as a system where each of these x's have transfer functions of the kind k i j divided by tau i j s plus 1 in the simplest case, right. Now, if I have to do a multi variable versus multi loop control, what would I do? I could still do an RGA, but essentially what I want to do is now, I want to try and see if I can do it in terms of blocks of multi variable controllers. So, can I for example, decide that this is a partition. So, this would be a 3 cross 3 centralized multivariable controller. Okay. This can be a 2 cross 2 another centralized multivariable controller. And as far as this overall plant is concerned, this overall plant is concerned, it essentially contains two uh, blocks of multivariable controllers. Are they interacting? Do they interact? Are they, are they independent? Is there an interaction between the two blocks? What do you think? Is there an interaction between the two subsystems? There are two subsystems here as you can see, depending on how dense the transfer function elements are, there is one on the top along the diagonal, there is a second 2 by 2 along the lower diagonal. So, they are, these are like two uh, multivariable controllers by themselves, okay. You can have one gigantic 5 by 5 multivariable controller, but maybe there is not a need because the off diagonal elements are relatively sparse. So, we can think of it as blocks of multivariable controllers, one would be a 3 by 3, other would be a 2 by 2. Do they interact is the question. There is a presence of interaction because there is one x here, okay. So, so, so if, if I were to ask you what is the interactor? 3, 3 cross 3 and 2 cross 2 want to interact. For example, if 2 cross 2 will consist of u4 and u5, any changes that u4 and u5 make, will it affect u1, u2, y3, u3 or no? We are assuming that that is completely sparse, so we Yes, but we have assumed that we are for the design purpose, but in practice will they interact or no? They will interact because there are two elements over there which are non-zero and likewise in this there is one element which is non-zero. So, there will be some amount of interaction. If there is going to be an interaction, can we implement feed forward controller there? So, it is like centralized controllers 3 by 3, 2 by 2 and two feed forward controllers that essentially take care of the interactions between these two things, okay. When you go even larger, for example, a fluidized catalytic cracking unit, it is a huge unit. What I have written as 3 by 3 and 2 by 2 become of the order of 25 by 25, 30 by 25, 40 by 50, you know, as large as those. In that case, it is always a good idea to look at it from a decentralized point of view, but bring in the impact of these interactions via feed forward control, okay. So, several decentralized multivariable controllers sharing their plans with each other. For example, this controller will say that I am going to manipulate u4 and u5 in this manner. Please plan your control moves in a way that accommodates these changes or vice versa. Now, that is there has to be a communication, there has to be a coordination between the two, okay. And once you do that, they can there, through that co co communication or coordination, they can come up with values of the u so that the whole subsystem is or the whole overall system is stable, right. So, that is something uh, that is actually a, 
area of uh, research and uh, control these days that how do you decentralize, how do you coordinate communication based decentralized control, uh, communication plus coordination based you know decentralized control and all of the like those are some of the areas that are currently um, aspect of research in large scale multivariable control. In fact, one of uh, the PhD students working with me is looking at large scale water distribution networks. In water distribution networks, the water that we get at our taps, there is a disinfectant that has to be used typically ClO2 which essentially kills the uh, microbial contamination. Okay. Now, if in large distribution networks, so you can you can visualize that in large water distribution networks you might actually go to a situation okay you can actually go to a situation where you know you have the source and this source essentially gets split into a number of nodes likewise this one there is a large distribution spatial distribution so water gets this is the source booster station and then it serves several communities on its uh, pipeline right and eventually it will terminate somewhere. So, there are several. So, you might decide that you can put one large amount of chlorine at the source with a hope that even at the end the chlorine levels will be sufficiently high that there will not be contaminant growth. To be able to do that the chlorine that you have to inject here has to be very high. Okay because you know there are several usage points all over by the time it reaches here maybe there is not much chlorine. Okay. So, if you inject too much chlorine here what happens is it exceeds the chlorine levels on the higher side and that is also toxic it forms uh, disinfectant byproducts. If the chlorine concentrations are low then contaminant grows. So, that is also harmful. So, the control problem is at each of these points on the node how do I maintain chlorine within an upper and lower bound okay. and how many such points could be there I might have as many points as the number of households that the distribution network is servicing, sensing of chlorine levels there so it becomes a gigantic number of uh, outputs. There are inputs one could be here you know this could be one input where I decide how much chlorine to add maybe you choose these as points where you could add chlorine maybe here, here, here okay, maybe here. So, there are fewer inputs to manipulate a large number of outputs to control and it is a zone control problem. Okay. So, if you have to do this centrally it becomes a very complex problem. What you could do is you could treat each of this as decentralized this is one decentralized and sorry, another decentralized, decentralized and so on. And then whatever decisions are made here they are communicated there is an exchange of information about the control actions taken so that the residual chlorine levels are maintained within that zone. So, a fairly complex problem uh, large scale water distribution networks uh, typically a multivariable large scale multivariable control problem okay. just by way of an illustration. Any questions up to this point? Okay. So, we thought we, we thought uh, we, we first looked at single uh, input single output control we thought single input single output for the multivariable case that made it multi loop we also thought of it as a multivariable controller if the interactions are very strong through the aspect of decoupling control okay so that would finish multivariable control and in the next two classes what we will do that is tuesday and half of thursday what we will do is uh, model predictive control and the last part of Thursday we will just do a quick summary and test uh, you know, preparation guide. So, any questions otherwise we will stop for today.